Bibles. Turn with me to the book of Joshua, chapter 6. You all wasn't expecting that, right? I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Venus, you like that? <laughs> Joshua, chapter 6. And as is customary here at the house of Judah, we stand in reverence to the reading of God's holy word. Joshua chapter 6, we'll be reading verses 1 to 10. I promised not to be long. I will deliver the message and leave because I know there's chicken somewhere for Pastor Steve <laughs> with his name written all over it. <laughs> Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 to 10. If I stop reading, please continue. Here beginning the reading of God's holy word altogether. Now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out, none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days." Seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times, and the priests shall blow with the trumpets. Continue. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat. And the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priest and said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. Yes. And he said unto the people, Pass on and come past the city and let him that is armed pass on before the ark of the Lord. Yes. And it came to pass when Joshua had spoken unto the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns passed on before the Lord and blew with the trumpets and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priest that blew with the trumpets and the rear ward came after the ark and the priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua had commanded the people saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth, until the day I bid you shout, then shall ye shout. So far the scriptures, allow me to read into you here in verses 9 and 10. And the armed men went before the priests that blew with the trumpets, and the reward came after the ark. The priests going on and blowing with the trumpets. And Joshua had commanded the people, saying, Ye shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day God bid you. I'm sorry. Until the day Jesus bid you. I'm sorry. Until the day I bid you shout. Then shall ye shout. I want to give a quick story, but before I give the quick story, I want you to realize that it's never my intention to be offensive to anyone. So if there's any word or words or statement or sentences that is included in this short story that's offensive to you, I apologize up front. Amen? Amen. There, was this, there was this story. There was a man who was a bit overweight. And he tried, he tried, he tried programs, he tried diets, and nothing worked. He, he didn't lose the weight. So he decided to go to his pastor, and like his pastor, like our pastor, was into health and fitness. The pastor said, I have the perfect solution for you. Tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., there'll be a knock on your door. Open the door and follow the instructions. So he went home. Just like the pastor said, next morning at 6 a.m. on the dot, a 
knock was on his door. He opened the door and there was this beautiful woman dressed in a jogging suit. And she said to him, Pastor said, if you catch me, you can marry me. <laughs> Pastor said, if you catch me, you can marry me. Keith just went on for weeks and months until he started to lose weight. And he said, the next day, I'm going to catch her. I know this. I feel it. I sense it in my bones. But he, when he reassessed the situation, he said, if I catch her and I have her, I may put back on the weight and she may leave me. So he gave up. He went back to his pastor, told him the entire story. The pastor said, I have the perfect solution for you. Six o'clock tomorrow morning, wait for the knock on the door. Answer the door. Six o'clock on the dot, came next morning, bang, 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 bang. He opened the door. There was a young lady who was a bit overweight. And she said to him, pastor said, if I catch you, you have to marry me. <laughs> It's very difficult to follow instructions, especially when you don't have the big picture, especially when you don't have all the pieces together. It's difficult. It's very difficult. And the first question that may pop into your head is why? Instructions are not easy to follow. Who, who here follow instructions very easily? Stop it. None of y'all, including myself. The Bible has some very difficult instructions. Very difficult instructions. Jesus saying, if somebody smack you on your right cheek, give them your left cheek. What? If you want to follow me, you have to deny mother and father, take up your cross, and Wait, hold up, Jesus, hold up. When I came to you, it was supposed to be easy. You're telling me to forsake the ones who gave birth to me and take up something heavy and carry it? Uh-uh, I didn't sign up for this. Following instructions is not easy. If your right hand offend you, if your left hand offend if your right eye offend you, pluck it out. But here's the one that got me all with that no. Discombobulated, flummoxed, perturbed. Love your enemies. No, Jesus, you tripping now. No, you, you really tripping now. Do what, Jesus? Love my enemies. Do good to them that persecute you and do all manner of evil against you. Instructions are not easy to follow. But I want you to turn to someone on your right or your left. Eyeball contact. Come on, quick. We ain't got all day. We got chicken to eat. And say this to them. I know it's difficult. Following instructions. But I guarantee you. If you follow instructions. God will open doors for you. But you have to. Trust the, Trust the process. Put those hands together for the Lord one time. Today's topic, trust the process. You may be seated. The name, the, the name Joshua, the name Joshua means Jehovah is salvation. And one of the highlighted verses of the book of Joshua is found in the first chapter, the first verse, which says, Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, God spoke. This simple sentence suggests that God is not in the business of speaking to multiple individuals at any given time. God speaks to one person per season because God is not the author of confusion. One thing we have to identify about Jericho, Jericho, historically speaking, is known as the oldest city in the world. And Jericho was sort of a gateway 
or a segue to get to Canaan. And many nations tried before to enter their Canaan land, but they couldn't overcome Jericho. Jericho wasn't this big, humongous city. It was really only 1,200 by 400 feet. But what stood out, it was how it was fortified. It had an inner wall and an outer wall. So armies couldn't just readily overtake and overcome them. One of the main issues in Jericho was idol worship. Idol worship to two primary gods. Two primary idols, rather. Molech and Ashtoreth. Molech was the god that received sacrifices of children and young kids. People sacrificed their babies and their young kids to Molech. And Ashtoreth, if anyone knows Ashtoreth, she was the goddess of sexual perversion. Now, I want to explain something to everyone here. At the end of the day, the enemy wants to do one thing and one thing only. He wants to take your worship away. He wants to steal your worship away from God. So what he tries to do is two main things. He does many things, but two main things he tries to do. He tries to attack our children, and he tries to attack our sexual purity. Because he knows, he knows, if your kids go a little off keel, it messes you up. It messes you up completely. And once your sexual purity is affected, you can't worship right. So the purpose of the enemy is really to distract you from worshiping the true and living God. The battle at Jericho had nothing to do with the acquisition of real estate. It was all God trying to get worship back onto himself. Now as a backdrop, Numbers, Numbers chapter 10 verses 40 to 45, the children of Israel attempted to attack Canaan and the Amalekites. So the Canaanites are familiar with the Israelites. And because they didn't seek the counsel and the permission of their leader Moses, they went and tried to attack the Canaanites. And they were utterly defeated because they did not listen to Moses. Understand that? They did not listen to Moses. So they tried to get the blessing. They tried to acquire the success. They tried to get everything that was supposed to come to them, but you cannot get it without the permission of your leader. Because that's the reason God put him as a conduit between him and you. What do you think he's there for? Why was Moses there? Why even say, I'm going to try and beat the Canaanites? And Moses just said, no, you can't. You know why? Because you hear from God. You hear from God and the leader don't. And that's, and that's a big problem in the church today. Yeah. Nobody said that you don't hear from God. But when it comes to the critical things of your life, yeah. it's in the mouth and the hands of the leader. So, so verse 1 says something that kind of shook me a little bit. It says, now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. And I said to myself, self, there's a problem. Or you can speak to yourself, just don't answer. That's, that's, that's the problem. I said, self, why did God promise Jericho, the kings, and all the inhabitants thereof, but the gates of Jericho are shut. Has God ever made you a promise? But whenever you try to go after that promise, all the doors are shut. The body of believers believe for some strange reason that because God promised you something, he has to give it to you in your time frame. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. The prophet Jeremiah went on to say, Thou shalt seek me and find me when thou seek me with all thine heart. The blessings has a price. God is not in the giving business. He's in the blessing business. God don't just give you stuff because you want stuff. He gives you stuff in a timely, seasonal manner. But there's a price. Time, effort, energy, discipline, sacrifice. 
the blessing has a price. So when the gates are shut before you, it's not because God said no. God says wait. Because you're not ready. You don't determine when you're ready. God says shut up does not mean shut down. Shut up means shh. Wait. Be still. I got you. Don't rush the brush. What happens when you rush the brush? The picture becomes distorted. Now you want to blame God for giving you something that you knew you weren't ready for. Well, God, you said, you, you said you'll grant me, God, the, the, the desires of my heart. You ain't ready to take care of five dollars. You want five million. You ain't ready. You're all too quiet. In verses two to five, God gave Moses, God gave Joshua how to do, thank you, Pastor Steve. God gave Moses how to do this thing now, right? What to do? And Pastor Steve just jumped my sermon like he was in my head all week. But I'm going to tap into some uncharted territory for a couple of seconds. May mess with your theology a little bit. God whew, gave Joshua the strategy, not the plan. Okay, pass that. Where, where you going with this now? Where you going with this? The strategy identifies the why. The plan identifies the how. Always align yourself with a leader who can give you both a strategy and a plan. It's not enough for me to tell you you're jacked up. I must give you a plan to help you get on the jacked up. I know that's poor English, Athena. I know it's poor English. But, but why, why, why should I just say, you know what? I know why you're jacked up. But you're not helping me get unjacked up. So where did, Mo sit down, sit down. Where did Joshua get the plan from? Numbers, no, Exodus chapter 3 verse 5. God speaking to Moses via the burning bush. God said to Moses, take off your shoes because the ground you stand on is holy. If you still have your Bibles, just jump quick back to chapter 5, the last three verses, 13, 14, and 15. You all know the story. Joshua had an encounter with the captain of the host, an angel. And Joshua was like, who you with? My enemies? I need to know. My enemies or me? The angel was like, forgive the bad English again. I am with none of y'all. None of yous. Because I'm on the Lord's side. I ain't fighting for none of y'all. I'm fighting for God. But the conclusion in verse 15, Joshua said, so what should I do? Look at verse 15 if you can, please. Verse 15 of chapter 5, the angel said, Joshua, Take off your shoes because the ground you stand on is holy ground. The only way you can get to your Canaan land, you have to follow the pattern of the leader. Because Joshua listened to what the angel said and removed his shoes from his feet like his leader moved his shoes from his feet. God opened up doors for Joshua that he wasn't even expecting. You want a good marriage? Follow the pattern of your leader. You want healthy money? Follow the pattern of your leader. You want a good business? Follow the ooh, pattern of your leader. Somebody shout, follow the leader. Follow the leader. When I move, you move. Yeah, you all need Jesus. You all need... The reason why nothing's working for you, you don't have a pattern to follow. Joshua had no frame of reference of what he was doing. But all he did was follow the leader. 
Somebody shout one more time. Follow the leader. Follow the leader. Sit down, sit down. God gave, God gave the strategy. Moses gave the plan. So for those of you who are waiting for God to give you the plan, it ain't going to work. You have to follow the plan that's given by the leader. God gives the why, the leader gives the how. You can't do this by yourself. God told him, send the warriors, the priests, the people, and follow up with more warriors. Verse 6 says something a little scary to me because it seems as if, Brother Keith, Joshua was being rebellious. Joshua didn't send the warriors first, Chris. Joshua sent the priests first. And it's not that he was being rebellious. He saw Moses at the Red Sea. Worship. He saw Moses at the Battle of the Amalekites. Once his hands were lifted, victory was a foregone conclusion. So he wasn't being rebellious. He was just following the leader. So when he did that, victory is already set in place for him. Our problem is we are bringing a rock to a gunfight. Pastor Antonio, you stole one of my scriptures this one, but the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and bringing into captivity every thought, everything that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Send worship first. Every battle you have, send worship. Every struggle you have, send worship. Every dysfunction you have, send worship. Somebody shout, send worship first. You need to understand this. Send worship first. Worship is just not a tool, it's a weapon. Use your weapon. You can use a tool to build. Worship builds. But you can also use that same tool as a weapon to destroy everything that comes before your presence. After worship ensued, sit down. Verse 9 says, God didn't just give them a reward. I had struggles pronouncing this word too. Yeah, me. I had struggles, right? Look at, look, look at, look at verse 9. A re, a, a, re, a reward. A, a re, R-E-A-R, ward, a reward. I'm saying, if I put worship in front, God's going to give me a reward. But he's going to give me a, a reward. What's the difference between a reward and a A reward is compensation for something you've done well. But a reward in the, in the Hebrew, it says to gather or to collect an all-purpose harvest. Now, when I saw all-purpose, lady, my mind jumped to flour. All-purpose flour. Now, what does all-purpose flour do? You can make cakes. You can make pies. You can fry chicken. Oh, God. So God says, when you put worship first, whatever the need is, I'm going to come behind you and give you an all-purpose harvest. But you have to send worship first. Worship is a precursor for the all-purpose harvest. An all purpose, I can't wait, Manji, for my all purpose harvest. Sit down, sit down, sit down. Sit down. Picture this the, the people are marching around Jericho. How many of you know that everybody wasn't plugged in that was marching? So 
So I want to paint a picture for you. I want to paint a picture of what it may have looked like thousands of years ago, people marching around the premises. So I need a, I need a, a, a few people. Uh, definitely Sister Shadida. Pastor Antonio. Mabule. Deacon Aaron, can you help me? I want to paint a picture of what possibly could have happened. Four to six million people marching. Everybody wasn't on the same page. Paint a picture for me, people. Paint a picture. Man, look, he, he got us walking. My feet hurt. Goodness gracious. Why you got to go that way? That's not where he told us to go. What's wrong with you? Wait, we got to be at church for Saturday prayer too? It's hot, man. I need some water. You need water? They, they forgot to shut the heat up. Why it's so hot in the church? My gosh. Your kids. Uh, you should stop being so late in the church so maybe your kids can go to. Why we got to keep walking? Why pastor wants us to walk? I can't believe it. It is hot in the church. Oh my gosh. Every day we got a meeting. Every day we got a meeting. How long we got to do this for? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Did Pastor really hear from God? No, no, no. How about that? You telling me we got to pay tithes and we got to get more money? Well, he ain't say you got to give it all. You know, God, God knows my heart. 10% is a lot, though. You know, I like to buy shoes. <laughs> we got to save money for 310 Creative Drive? Really? I don't really think we need to go there. I mean, that's far. I mean, it's good here. I'm just a little hot, but look, going to 310, that's a lot of work. Why we can't just stay here? Thank you. Give them a hand, please. I want you guys to under understand this. Hear me, hear, me, hear me carefully. Everyone that's with you is not for you. Singing in the choir with you, not for you. On the usher board, not for you. In share, not for you. Shouting, not for you. Pretending to worship, not for you. This is how you identify the with versus the for. Ask the question, what do you think about the leader's vision? That's when the truth comes out. When you ask about the leader's vision. Verse 10, it says, Joshua told him, and I, and I, and I, I studied this really carefully, Nowhere from verses 1 to 5, God told Joshua to tell the people, don't speak. He said, don't shout. Don't shout. So God says, don't shout. Joshua comes behind him and says, when I say the shout, shout. Not when God said a shout. When I grew up in a generation where everybody wanted to get, get a word from the Lord. Have you ever been around those people? I need a word from the Lord. I need to hear. God don't talk to you like that. Stop. God don't have time to talk to you like that. God talks to the leader. It is in the hands of the leader that your answer exists. Not in your brain nor your emotions. You're gone quiet again. I'm just saying to you, follow the leader. That's all I'm saying to you. So now... After Joshua utilized the strategy and he executed the plan, something happened in verse 20. The walls fell flat. And what I'm about to say to you people of God, please don't think it's biblically sound. It's not. But there was a study done by a geologist. A geologist is a scientist who studies the chemical composition of the earth. And what it does, why it does, when it does. This geologist said that it was not uncommon for an army to march around a city before attacking it. 
It's not uncommon. It was common. So this wasn't uncommon. But he said four to six million people marching in unison six times around a property would have the tendency to weaken the foundation of the property. But on the seventh day, seven times was added. So, oh God. So they marched 13 times around this property. So not only did they weaken the foundation, they destroyed the structure with the sound waves of their voices. I don't know how true that theory is. But if there's a wall standing before you today, I dare you, I challenge you, send sound waves of worship against your dysfunction. Send sound waves of worship against your disability. Send sound waves of worship. Do it now. Do it now. Send sound waves. Sound waves of worship. Sound waves of worship. Destroy. Destroy. Destroy every wall. Every wall has been, oh God, oh God. If you just send sound waves. It wasn't one time because you have multiple walls before you. So do it again. Send some more sound waves. Destroy that wall. Destroy that dysfunction. Destroy that sickness. Destroy that bad habit. Destroy that addiction. Destroy it. Oh God. Oh God. Until you're satisfied. Until you're satisfied that your wall came down. Depression has to go. Failure has to go. Every struggle has to go. But it will not go without sound waves of worship. Worship will not tear it. Worship will not crumble it. Worship will destroy it. This is the anointing that destroys the yoke. Sound waves of worship. After the strategy worked, now the plan is going to be placed in effect. The wall came down. But remember, God never told Joshua how to overcome the inhabitants. God didn't. But now the walls came down. So Joshua is putting in place the sound wave of worship theory. The worship killed the inhabitants. No one questioned that. Where were the inhabitants? Worship destroyed the enemy. Worship destroys the enemy. Worship destroys the enemy. Worship destroys the enemy. Worship destroys the enemy. Destroys the enemy. Name your enemy and worship against him. So God told Joshua, tell the people, take the spoil. How many of you know that God never sends you into a battle without assuring you a spoil? There's always a spoil where God sends you into a battle. Always a spoil. If you submit to the leader, God said to Joshua, tell them, take the gold, the silver, the precious stone, and put it in the treasury of the temple. Don't touch what is mine. Don't touch what is mine. Put it in the treasury of the temple and leave it there. And everything else in the Hebrew doctrine, this is called Herem. In the Hebrew doctrine, God says, put what is mine, destroy what is not mine. So in addition to putting everything into the treasury, they had to destroy man, woman, child, beast, property, livestock. And it means this. Everything that prevents your devotion to Jehovah God, destroy it. Don't keep no ideology. Don't keep no theology. Don't keep no history. Don't keep no ancestry. Don't keep anything. 
your culture even. Don't keep anything that prevents total devotion to Jehovah God. Verse 26 ends by saying, Joshua said, Joshua, not God, Joshua. Cursed as every man that tries to rebuild what God destroyed. Not only you, but your family shall be cursed. We have a tendency to try to expand the life cycle of relationships. It's done. It's over. The legacy is gone. The expiration date is gone. God told Samuel, stop crying for Saul. It's over. I'm done with him. Move on now. But we, we, we in our flesh... We like to add on time. The relationship is toxic. It's poisoning you. God already put an expiration date on the relationship. God put an expiration date on that business deal. God put an expiration date on that friendship. God put an expiration date on that church membership. It's done. Do not rebuild what I have destroyed. So this is what we do with a carton of milk. It says, sell by December 15. Well, well, Pastor Ali, it didn't say use by. It said sell by. And this is why we are trying to find nutritional value in things that have expired. It's over. God said it's over. And it's no way possible we can speak about Joshua chapter 6 without mentioning Rahab. And I believe this is the season, Pastor Steve, where God is using the gifts and talents of people who are not even attached to the kingdom, but is attached to the vision. Because she attached herself to the vision, not even part of the kingdom, not even a called out one, not even a sanctified one. Because she plugged into the vision and trusted the process. No longer was she known by her reputation of Jericho. But now she is known by her characteristics of Canaan. Because she plugged into the system. And God allowed her passageway into Hebrews chapter 11. The hall of faith. So as I conclude... I want to say this to you very specifically. The battle of Jericho wasn't really a battle. God said, I gave it to you. I gave it. When we don't trust the process, it becomes a battle. We put so much unnecessary pressure on ourselves when we don't trust the process. Everybody said.